Hey everyone, happy streaming Sunday. It's Magic Molly coming at you with another magical movie review. I apologize in advance, uh, my body is going through cold season. If I sound a little stuffy, it's because I am. And also my dumbass decided that wearing a long sleeve shirt to review Pocahontas was a good idea, so I'm a little sweaty already, so. Let's see how this goes. We're continuing our Disney Princess series. Uh, next up in the list is uh, Pocahontas, which Disney released in 1995. This is our seventh movie in our Disney Princess list. I can't believe it's already been seven movie reviews. It seems a little crazy to me. I went with a more natural look today. Didn't do anything crazy with my hair. Didn't do anything crazy with my face, clearly. With the cold going on, contacts just aren't happening because my eyes are so dry, which seems crazy with how drippy my nose is. It's like the moisture just moved to a different place. For those of you who haven't been around for a magical movie review before, we break things down into about five different segments here. One, we'll do a magical recap. Then we'll move on to a segment for pros and cons, which I like to call magical moments and enchanting efforts. And then we'll talk about my VMP or very magical person of the film, the person that stands out the most to me, the person that I feel applies the most to the story or um, my favorite character at the very least. And then we'll go into a movie rankings of where I rank all of the Disney princess movies so far. And then for all the nerds out there like me who like to understand the origin stories of our favorite Disney movies, stick around for the end for a surprise ending. So we'll start with our magical recap. Um, this is where I bring you the quickest recap of the Disney film that I possibly can. Typically around 30 to 45 seconds if I can swing it. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. It's 1607. Englishmen going to find a new colony. Bring John Smith because he's seen savages before. Pocahontas is a little naughty, but mostly just loves doing her own thing. Her dad, the chief, wants her to marry Cocoa. She takes a relaxing boat ride and asks the river what she should do. Englishmen land ashore. John and Pocahontas meet. A real Romeo and Juliet thing going on. Then Cocoa is killed by John's friend Thomas because Thomas thinks Cocoam is trying to kill John. John is sentenced to die by the chief. Pocahontas saves him by throwing her body on top of his before her father. The chief lets him go, but Governor Radcliffe, who's the villain, is like, nah, somebody else to die anyway. John jumps in front of the bullet for the chief. They send him back to England to get medical help. Pocahontas stays with her people. I thought it was pretty good. I actually didn't practice that one that much. I wrote that one ahead of time and like kind of read it through in my head, but that's about it. I mean, we're all pretty familiar with the Pocahontas story from the popularization through Disney, but also because it's based on a true story, which we'll get into in the end, which based on the research that I did, um, there's quite a bit of interesting history behind the Native American acceptance of the story of Pocahontas and Disney's adaptation and how it has been perceived over the last few years um, and how the evolution of that view has changed. Before we get there, we're going to dive into our magical moments from the film Pocahontas. So I had quite a few. Off the bat, the animation specifically where the title of Pocahontas is showing up and then we're zooming in and it's kind of zooming over the river and it's following the river to show the um, Native Americans coming home from war and kind of d bringing us into the story of the Pocahontas side of the story at least because we've had the Englishman and, and John Smith saves Thomas from drowning and all that crap. Uh, but just the zooming in and the landscape and the canoes, it's just absolutely beautiful. The colors and the vividness, which I think is purposeful for just setting Pocahontas up for how colorful her personality is because everything has been kind of dreary in the movie up until this point. I also found quite a bit of comedic relief throughout the movie. Miko, for example, I think he's a hilarious animal sidekick. Just I wrote down a couple examples as the movie was was going through but when we first find Pocahontas and like she's jumping off the cliff to join her friend in the boat 
Miko does kind of the swan dive after her and then realizes about halfway through that he's made a huge mistake and then tries to use the hummingbird flit as a, kind of a life raft as he's <laughs> diving down, which I, I don't laugh out loud that much at movies anymore, but that one definitely made me giggle. And what were some of the other ones? Oh, when he when Miko meets John Smith for the first time and gets the, the cookies or the biscuits, he starts munching on them and he's like shoving them all in his mouth and then like wipes the crumbs off and then looks down at the crumbs on the, the floor and then just like picks them up with his finger and eats them. Which I think surprisingly I saw myself <laughs> in that. <laughs> in that moment. Like no snack is going to waste. With Miko too, really just his relationship with Percy, uh, Governor Ratcliffe's dog. I think that they just have a really sweet relationship and we almost see the evolution of their relationship as a reflection of John Smith and Pocahontas's relationship. Like they're coming from feuding uh, families or feuding groups and then eventually they're their besties and Percy ends up staying behind which I think is cute. Grandmother Willow is also another like huge comedic relief for me because just the content of the movie itself can is actually pretty heavy um, just talking about cultural differences and just kind of putting light on a very dark time in American history. Grandmother Willow is a representation of Native American culture and just kind of what spirit means and respecting ancestral roots, like literally roots. Um, while she represents so much to me for Native American culture, she's also just freaking hilarious. When she meets John Smith for the first time and, and tells him to come closer, she's like, oh my bark is worse than my bite. And I died. Like I just didn't realize how funny that part was until I started watching this movie as an adult. And then of course it goes without saying that the soundtrack is is really good, especially from Pocahontas. She has a voice that's just amazing in this film. It's also one of the few films where like she gets to showcase her voice so much. Colors of the Wind and Just Around the River Bend, she's the only one singing and then she sings throughout the movie in other songs as well, but those are just strictly her princess songs, which we don't get in many other uh, Disney princess movies so far. Those are just real Disney fan classics. Like, I think you have to really be a big Disney fan to really love those songs, because they're just, I don't know if it's just me, but I don't think they're as popular as the rest of them. Um, but in the Disney community and the, the circles that I familiarize myself with, I think they're they're pretty popular. I also forgot how catchy um, Dig, Governor Ratcliffe's song is. Like I'm just like jamming along and also laughing because I'm like you're here to dig for gold and there's nothing. Like it's Virginia where you clearly didn't do enough research here. And also just another one for a magical moment. I enjoyed this particular part of the movie throughout but it really didn't stand out to me as to how much I loved it until we got almost to the end. So I realized that when Pocahontas throws herself onto John Smith to save him and uh, the chief is is holding the the weapon above his head, the wind comes through and it's like this reddish pink and orange color and it kind of like just moves through him. He mentions earlier in the film that I feel your mother every time the wind blows, that the wind in itself is its own character. And in this particular scene, it's Pocahontas's mother that's kind of present and moving through him and really makes him feel somewhat remorseful and, and kind of makes him stop and doesn't want to kill John Smith. And kind of reflecting back on that, in Colors of the Wind specifically, like the, the colors of the leaves represent the wind and how it kind of starts relatively dark and then moves to warmer colors through the end of the song, which I think is like John Smith and Pocahontas's revelation that like they have so much more in common because we share this earth, which is just incredibly beautiful. It's definitely a very guiding character, 
like it guides her uh, when she realizes that John Smith is her destiny or like her yeah destiny I think that's the right word but yeah I guess I guess I had more magical moments than I originally thought I would have going into the movie I never really had Pocahontas at the top of my list of my favorite movies I thoroughly enjoyed it watching it as an adult for my enchanting efforts for things that I didn't really enjoy about the movie I had I had a few first off very first thing that I noticed when they're in England and they're getting on the boat, literally they all have English or Scottish accents of some kind, except for John Smith. He has an American accent because of course it's Mel Gibson and Mel Gibson doesn't have to do shit. Like why is he the only one without an accent? They don't really explain, like his accent is American, but he's clearly not from America because they're still discovering. Like that's- that- I didn't really get that. That was a plot hole to me. And, and I realized as I was reflecting back on other Disney films, like they do that quite a bit. There's a little bit of a mixture of accents in some of these films. That one in particular stood out the most of all the films that we had watched so far. The character that I can absolutely do without is freaking Wiggins, like Ratcliffe's like little bitch boy. Like he is a kiss ass to the nth degree. I like gruel. Okay, shut up. Who cares? Nobody was asking you. He feels like he's providing cheap humor. I don't know. I just it wasn't even like slapstick humor. Just it was stupid. I didn't enjoy his character at all. Like I thought you could cut out that character completely and the movie would remain intact. I'm also not a huge fan of Governor Ratcliffe as a villain. As I was writing that down and, and writing the reason why, I realized that in the Beauty of the Beast review, I mentioned that Gaston is actually one of my favorite uh, Disney villains of all time because he's so real and we all have a Gaston in our lives, kind of that pompous jerk and just somebody that's kind of flaunting their their good looks or their talent or what have you. I kind of questioned, okay, so why is Governor Ratcliffe then not also one of my favorite villains? Because if you think about it, he's probably one of the most real Disney villains out there. Like this is literally based off of real characters, real events. So why doesn't the same rule apply here? Why isn't he one of my favorite villains? And I think it's because one, he doesn't get very much screen time. So his character development is nothing. Like he's just a jerk that likes gold and then tries to kill the chief and then ends up, I'm assuming he dies at the end. He also isn't funny or he doesn't really have real personality like literally his personality plane is very flat uh his range is that of a teaspoon as hermione would say like he literally just cares about finding gold and that's it and like not being embarrassed by the court back home like it just i don't know i just i just didn't really enjoy that part very much Sorry, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. So that was it. Those were really the only enchanting efforts that I had, but I feel like those were pretty big ones. You kind of have to somewhat enjoy the antagonist because it makes you appreciate the protagonist or protagonists that much more. It wasn't really any kind of close tie to choose my VMP or very magical person from the film. For me, it's Pocahontas straight up. The Disney princess films so far, I'm learning a lot about just how it portrays women in general, but this one I think is a really good representation for just young women. We're also getting cultural diversity for young women. So I think she's a really strong female character and she like marches to the beat of her own drum, no pun intended. She's got attitude, she has a much larger perspective on the world for someone who hasn't been far from home before. Like she can see so much farther past that of her own people and of the Englishmen that have arrived into her territory. Like she's able to see both sides and truly understand what it means to just have love in her heart but also like she's still very loyal in the end while she loves john smith like she knows that she has a responsibility for her people and she chooses to stay that's also just a good moral like underlying moral like 
there's so many different types of love and loyalty that she chooses the path that's right for her. And I think that that's a constant thing that she does throughout the movie is that she chooses the path that's right for her. Does that sometimes get her in trouble? Absolutely. Is it always the best decision? I mean, who's to say? I mean, Coco was murdered because she chose to run away and go see John Smith and there was a whole misunderstanding. But I think overall her attitude and how down to earth she is and how much she loves animals and nature. I think that's just a very admirable, admirable set of qualities to have um, as a Disney princess representative. All right, so it's getting incredibly difficult to rank these Disney movies now because just because a movie is at the bottom of my list doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. And that's not to say Pocahontas is at the end of my list. I just enjoyed the journey so far and watching them in kind of almost rapid fire order makes it even more difficult because it's all kind of starting to blend together just a little bit just based on everything that i've kind of researched and and dove into and the amount of magical moments versus enchanting efforts i'm gonna go with beauty and the beast is still at the top little mermaid Aladdin, Cinderella, then Pocahontas, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty. So that puts Pocahontas fifth in my list of the seven that we've been able to watch together so far. So about the middle, I'd say, um, I, I actually went back and forth between like which would go first, Cinderella or Pocahontas, and I honestly can't tell you what was my final decision. I think it was more of a gut feeling, but that was a really difficult one to place in the list because I it's it's still not my favorite Disney princess film, but I appreciate Pocahontas as a Disney princess so much more now as an adult. So I thought putting her around the middle of my order was a pretty fair representation of how I felt about the film. All right, so that's the end of the magical movie review itself. So for all of you other nerds out there, now we're gonna dive into the origin story. I mean, it was actually quite difficult to go into the origin stuff itself because there is so much information about Pocahontas from a perspective of like this is the story that we've been told forever versus this is the real story and that was a hard pill to swallow. My telling of the story from my history lessons in school of course have been extremely whitewashed. Everything had been based off of John Smith telling him the story because of course back then in Native American history it's all an oral history. Everything's told and passed down from family to family uh, through storytelling and John Smith apparently kept kind of a journal and told his version of the story and that's what was made history. And there is a long distaste of the Pocahontas story from many different sides. A lot of people uh, considered her a traitor, kind of falling in love with a white man and kind of betraying her people. But we'll, we'll start with the facts that we definitely know. So Pocahontas was born, they, they're saying like 1590s. Um, so they can't exactly place it, but 1595 is the most consistent year that I've seen. That means that in 1607, when John Smith and, and everybody came over and discovered Jamestown, um, she was 12. If this whole like love story thing is true, that's freaking creepy for this like grown ass white man to be macking on a 12 year old Native American girl even more terrible things like that have happened and are happening in the world, but it's still disgusting to think about. In their time of trying to settle Jamestown, somehow John Smith was captured by Pocahontas' brother and brought to the village. Um, and they interrogated him and of course like got information from him. And there there's evidence to support that they performed some kind of ritual 
whether it's kind of a purification of some kind or just a ritual before they let him go because they ultimately let him, him go he he cooperated with them and and everybody was good in the ritual they're saying that Pocahontas was chosen to be the one that like throws herself on the body of John Smith and saves him but it was like a scripted event whereas John Smith didn't understand the language and didn't understand what was going on they're saying that this event happened just like in the movie she throws her body on him and, and saves him in his mind he thinks it's a romantic event when in all actuality it has nothing to do with love whatsoever they send him on his merry way then they use Pocahontas as kind of a, a peace symbol when the Indians come to the settlement and try to share information or bring food or however. <laughs> um, if Pocahontas is with them, then the English settlers know that like, hey, like things are good, like John Smith and her, like they have a thing, like whatever. And there was information shared back and forth. And then what I haven't really been able to nail down are the events in between that and her traveling to London because there is evidence that she did go to London. So there's there's arguing information as to whether like she went willingly or if she were kidnapped. Um, but while she was in London and remained there for a time, she met and married John Rolfe, who was a Christian but to be able to marry, she had to convert to Christianity. And when she did that, when she was baptized, her her new name was Rebecca. And like, if you're gonna get baptized, like why do you, I, and this is the part that I just don't understand about Christianity, I guess, is like, why would you have to change your name? Like that was your given name. I don't, I. I guess I don't really understand because I, I get it from a like, if you're baptized, you need a God given name. But if, if you're a true believer in God, wouldn't you believe that whatever name that they were given when they were born is their God given name? Like, don't you think that all of the things in their life are happening for a reason and are purposeful? I don't, I don't know. And, and I'm probably getting too far into that, but I just don't get why she would have to change her name to Rebecca. She had a son with John Rolfe named Thomas. They were going to travel back to America to see her family or, or go back to Jamestown or however. I don't really know the reason why, but um, because she wasn't, her body hadn't built an immunity to all the European diseases, she gets what I believe to be smallpox on the ship and she actually passes away. The real story, of course, isn't as romantic as Dizzy makes it out to seem. Um, there's no love relationship with John Smith whatsoever in the real story. She actually is a symbol of peace for the relationship between the Powhatan people and the settlers of Jamestown. Now, because written documentation wasn't wasn't really a thing back then it's really hard to say what story is a hundred percent true because this from what i've gathered is a collection of like the history uh channel the smithsonian um an article from the times all of course like probably whitewashed information as well but we always have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt when we're learning new information about these real people and I think we're in a place in society where we're learning a little bit more and, and being a little bit more open to the light and the dark sides of the story. And a couple things that I were I was reading really opened my eyes to just the perception of Pocahontas because in Native American culture she was seen as a traitor for such a long time and that she converted to Christianity was like a huge basically a slap in the face to to her people. I don't know how recent this change is and it's probably going to be an ever-changing thing but when Disney released a movie about Pocahontas I think there was a slight shift in how it was viewed because one of how the story ended of course she didn't choose love she chose her people which I think is a little bit more of a respectful ending than what people had um expected 
but also just the fact that it provided representation for beautiful Native American women and uh, was a, a brave and, and very independent role model for young Native American girls and I think I think people are a little bit more open to using Pocahontas as a role model for children versus someone that they don't really want to talk about. I definitely want to learn more. I feel like I didn't have as much time as I wanted to to dive into the story. But I'm going to post all of the sources that I use below. If there's anything else you guys know of or have read or have personal connection to any of this history, absolutely feel free to share. Um, this has been an incredible learning experience for me, especially with having Aladdin as our last movie and Mulan as the one coming up. We're getting so far into a culturally diverse group of Disney princesses that is one that I want to learn more about and dive into and really have a good understanding of where we are and, and where we're coming from with these Disney films. That's my review of Pocahontas. I know that I've seemed pretty chill, but this is like the, the best lighting that I could find in the house right now. Um, because I, with my glasses, everything reflects off of these bad boys. And if you can't tell, they're kind of like that blue light. So not only does it reflect, it's like reflecting blue onto my face. So it was hard to find a spot that didn't make me look super weird. I just appreciate everybody that's been watching these. For those of you who have reached out and said that you've enjoyed these, I, I so appreciate that. It's been really fun to do these and kind of dive back into what I enjoyed as a child watching these movies and just learning so much about their origins and, and I don't know. It's just been a really eye-opening experience. So thanks for following along. Come back next Sunday for another magical movie review. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and check us out on Instagram at magicxmolly or magicbymolly. It's what I tend to go for. I hope you have a magical week.